A hovering hummingbird represents a dynamic disequilibrium. As long as it hovers, it represents a persistent dynamic disequilibrium. But let's generalize this beyond hovering hummingbirds and ask, what does it take to maintain a dynamic disequilibrium? More to the point, what does it take to maintain a specified persistent dynamic disequilibrium? The word specified in this phrase is very important because the remarkable thing about the hummingbird, or any other living thing for that matter, is that it maintains a persistence of form and function in the face of physical forces that are working continually to undermine it. In the hovering hummingbird, this disruptive force is gravity. Yet the hummingbird itself is a persistent dynamic disequilibrium of form and function. A hummingbird is recognizable as a hummingbird throughout its life, after all. What explains that? Let's illustrate this problem. We'll stick with our familiar hummingbird as an example. The hummingbird exists because it takes in a stream of matter, molecules consisting mostly of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and a host of other minerals. This inward flowing stream of matter becomes organized into the form of the hummingbird. That's the specificity. It takes work to do this, and the energy to do the work comes in the form of so-called free energy. Free energy is a bit of a broad term. It refers to a form of potential energy that is capable of doing work. We'll get into some of the details of what free energy is momentarily. At the same time, the hummingbird is continually degrading, releasing a stream of those very same elements, this time, of course, in the form of different molecules. At the same time, the hummingbird releases energy in the form of heat. Thus, the hummingbird is not so much a thing as it is a process, an engine that does work to produce the hummingbird's form and function as rapidly as it's degraded to heat and disorder. We can put some numbers to this question. Before we can do that, however, we first have to introduce a concept known as the half-life. Let's say there is some substance, like carbon, flowing through the body of the hummingbird. This could be carbon in the form of glucose, for example. For now, let's not worry about the carbon intake into the hummingbird. Let's just pay attention to the carbon that is continually leaving the hummingbird, mostly as carbon dioxide. We're going to sort of freeze intake and watch what happens as this carbon leaves the body. The hummingbird starts off at some time zero with some quantity of carbon residing within it. Just to make things simple, we will express this as some fraction of an initial concentration of carbon, which will run from one down to zero. In a living hummingbird, it's not possible to freeze intake, of course, but we can still measure this loss by tagging carbon molecules with some sort of marker. When this is measured in real life, the marker usually is an isotope of carbon, like carbon-14 or carbon-13. If we measure the concentration of this initial load of carbon, it will decline through time. The decline follows a particular mathematical form, which is the so-called exponential decay curve. This kind of exponential decay is common in dynamic systems like the hummingbird, or any other living system for that matter. You may already have encountered it in chemistry, referring to the decay of radioactive isotopes that are commonly used in dating applications such as carbon dating, for example. Turning back now to the loss of carbon from the body. The time required for this initial carbon burden to decline to half its original value is the half-life of carbon in the body. One can measure the turnover of carbon in living tissues quite simply using a stable isotope of carbon as a marker. And here are some results taken from a study of carbon turnover rates in gerbils. You can see that the half-life of carbon varies quite a bit in different tissues ranging from 6.4 days in the liver all the way up to 47 and a half days in hair. Okay, let's focus on the liver. 
The half-life of 6.4 days means that half the carbon in the liver is replaced every 6.4 days. Within a month, that is over a time representing roughly five half-lives, only about 3% of the liver's original carbon is left. Despite this almost complete turnover of carbon, however, the form of the liver has not changed. Only the actual material content of the liver has changed. This underscores an important point about the specified persistent dynamic disequilibrium that we are designating as life. The material composition of the liver isn't really relevant here because the material composition of the liver changes almost completely every month. But the form, and hence the function, of the liver, on the other hand, persists. This can only happen if carbon is brought in and organized into the form of the liver at a rate as fast as the carbon leaves. This disequilibrium extends to the entire body. This means one could measure the total turnover time of the body mass, not just carbon. In humans, for example, the turnover time is about 79 days. In other words, the total mass of the body turns over nearly completely every 79 days. In mice, which are considerably smaller, the turnover time is shorter, about 10 days. And for our hummingbird, an order of magnitude smaller still, the turnover time is six days. This means that I, or you, are materially an entirely different person every 79 days, even though our form and function stay the same. Let's diagram this a little more systematically. The basic thermodynamics of life involves free energy doing work on disorderly matter to arrange it into orderly matter of some specified form, as a human, or a mouse, or a hummingbird. Some fraction of the free energy is dissipated as heat, as the second law of thermodynamics demands. The orderly matter, for its part, spontaneously degrades back to disorderly matter, releasing heat in the process. This underscores an important point about orderly matter, namely that it is a form of potential energy storage. Low entropy represents a disequilibrium state that can be tapped to do work on its inevitable slide to equilibrium. In living systems, these simple energetic transactions can be coupled together into chains of transactions that can become very complex. Let's look at the interaction between the flower and the hummingbird. Light comes in from the sun into the flower, to the plant really, and the free energy in the light powers the conversion of disorderly carbon dioxide and water into orderly glucose and oxygen. Some of this free energy is released as heat, as specified by the second law. The hummingbird takes in this glucose and oxygen, does work with it, and in the process converts it back into carbon dioxide and water plus heat. If we take a closer look at what's happening inside the hummingbird, we see a similar suite of energetic transactions. The glucose and the oxygen serve as free energy and oxidant to power the conversion of ADP plus phosphate into ATP, with the glucose and oxygen reduced again to carbon dioxide and water. The ATP, in turn, goes to do work to power the persistence of the hummingbird's form and function. This process has a special name. It's called anabolic work, and it can include things like mechanical work, fueling various kinds of order-producing reactions, and synthetic work in which complex molecules are synthesized from simpler precursors. All the products of anabolic work are unstable, and these spontaneously revert back to disorderly matter. This process also has a special name. It's known as catabolism. Following from this, the energy that was stored in the form of glucose and oxygen is ultimately released as heat. In all instances, we see free energy being used to power the continual production of orderliness. Glucose and oxygen from CO2 and water, ATP from ADP plus phosphate, complex molecules and processes from simple molecules and simpler processes. All this order-producing work 
offsets the continual degradation of order to disorder. This order-producing work does not stop the degradation, of course. It just works to produce order as fast as disorder. In this way, the entire system is sustained in a state of persistent dynamic disequilibrium. So, we see the essential thermodynamic nature of life. Work must be done continually to produce a specified orderliness that can persist in the face of its continual degradation to disorder. The continuous degradation to disorder is a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. That is a fact of life that cannot be evaded. What life does is to engage in work that produces specified orderliness as fast as it degrades. As we've seen, this involves a series of energy transactions that, even at their simplest, can be quite complex and convoluted. Furthermore, this complexity can extend beyond the organism, encompassing not just hummingbirds or nectar-bearing flowers, but hummingbirds and flowers working together as a system.